Okay, so I wanted to share this article with you guys and just show you how extremely awful it is. So right off the bat, massively on the go, Monster Hunter Rises demo is merely a less pretty taste of Monster Hunter World. So right off the bat, we already know that this article is going to be pretty trash. Putting it in that terms, especially when you're comparing a game that was on PS4, Xbox, PC, stuff like that, this game is on a Switch. So one of the things that is obviously going to be a thing is that Rise is not going to be able to graphically stand up with Monster Hunter World. So saying that and making that the headline of the article, either trying to be clickbaity or just pretty dumb. So here we go. I have to admit from the demo Monster Hunter Rise isn't what I was expecting, having played Monster Hunter World on both PS4 and PC. So yeah, he's played it on PS4 and PC and he wants to compare how Rise looks to Monster Hunter World. That's dumb. As well as having cross-culture experience with the series, I have certain expectations. I'm not saying I'm the best at the game nor the most engaged. See, like right off the bat, this is what happened last time. I know that I made another video before about an article and like right off the bat, they say, hey, I'm not qualified to make a solid article on this game, but I'm going to go ahead and do it anyways. So when I first played Monster Hunter World on PS4, I felt like Capcom had really created something special, which they did. I'll still argue that Monster Hunter World on PS4 is the most accessible, most intuitive, and perhaps the most social Monster Hunter game ever released. So already right off the bat, making grandiose statements when he's not the best at the game, which doesn't really matter. Seal doesn't always equal knowledge, nor the most engaged. That is the part, nor the most engaged but he's ready to call Monster Hunter World the most intuitive, most accessible, most this, most that. Yeah, that those, those two things don't match. But Rise this far feels like a step back in terms of accessibility, but a step forward in, as our own Chris Wolfie Neal put it, adding a little more skill ceiling to the series. Okay, so remember this Chris Neal because it's going to be pretty frequent in the article that this person that is, uh, you know, qualified to say all these grandiose statements about Monster Hunter World being the greatest thing ever in the Monster Hunter series, he seems to have to check back in with this Chris Neal and have things clarified by him a lot. But let's jump back here and talk about in terms of accessibility. Now, I don't know if he's talking about straight up accessibility as far as you know just like jumping into the game if he's talking about legitimate like accessibility as somebody whose entire channel was you know started by uh talking about playing video games with actual disabilities i can tell you that rise literally hands down is the most accessible monster hunter game there has ever been and i can say that now because i've only played a demo and the options that they've given me, things like uh, clicking to aim or like, you know, just pressing a button to aim instead of having to hold, different things like that. Focus camera actually being a thing, all of that stuff. If he's talking about legitimate accessibility, he's already way wrong. But let's continue anyways. I know I don't usually say much about graphics, but almost immediately when I started up the game, I noticed the graphics on offer here. World certainly spoiled me. Yes, because it is a PC, PS4, and Xbox One title. The grass art feels like merely a fuller version of what we had in Monster Hunter 4 for the Nintendo 3DS. Pause. So, people who have actually played the Monster Hunter games and actually enjoy the series. I want you to comment on that statement. Playing the Rise demo and then playing Monster Hunter 4 on the 3DS. Graphically, I would like you guys to tell me what you think of that statement. The environmental colors are quite drab, though I saw a few lesser creatures with some nice coloring. Overall, though, the visuals made me feel as if I was trying an older game when playing on my TV screen. Admittedly, playing in the handheld mode invoked a sense of nostalgia, but I feel like that once again brings up the comparison to Monster Hunter 4, which wasn't a bad game, but that's hardly a compliment after what we got in Monster Hunter World. So back to it again. He's comparing Rise, a Switch title, 
a portable console to PS4, Xbox One, PC, and now even the next-gen consoles. It's not just the graphics that are dated, it's also the design choices. While harvestables are obvious, control pop-ups are awkward. For example, while going through my inventory, I kept getting a pop-up about how to use items. I don't know exactly what he's talking about there because the only pop-ups that I ever got, <coughs> excuse me, was uh, if like I got hit and my health was low, they would tell me to use a potion. After my stamina dropped over time, they would tell you you need to eat rations because your stamina drops. I don't know what he's talking about with these awkward pop-ups though. Uh, I'm still unsure as to why the pop-up occurred and why following this did not cause it to disappear, but that was that. On the other hand, using the wire bug, one of the game's newest features created just one pop-up. I went through the tutorial to help me get through all of the new additions at least once, but there's so very, very much to learn that proper pop-ups would be. So, right in this paragraph, awkward pop-ups that kept popping up, ends paragraph I just wish that there were more proper pop-ups that would be really helpful I mean the game also did away with scout flies which helped bring the players attention to usable environmental effects as well as pointed out where the monster you're tracking is instead rise just uses a big immersion shattering arrow okay so as it's already been clearly stated the arrow is not going to be in the actual game itself, and and it's definitely something that you can easily turn off in the options. But going back to just absolute contradictions, he's talking about immersion shattering arrows and stuff like that, but then He's talking about how the game like isn't accessible for people. What could make something more accessible than a giant arrow pointing you to the monster? And let me reiterate that if it's immersion shattering, you can literally turn it off in the options. No problem. A veteran of Monster Hunter probably would know something like that, but obviously this guy is not engaged in the series and it shows well we did get some new features one that i really miss is the series staple of mounting i don't know if i would call mounting a series staple we've gone from combat well mounted to mounted combat the former was key when you could use an aerial attack to get on top of a monster to attack it this could be especially useful for tail cutters like me as we could safely unload a barrage of targeted damage to ensure breaks it was also pretty cool so somebody that is even more of a veteran to the series than myself. I need you to tell me when mounted, uh, not mounted combat, but when mounting came to Monster Hunter. I, I, I really need that to be stated because he's talking about it as a staple as if it's been there since like day one. The new wyvern riding mechanic is not that. While there are creatures that can help make mounting easier, the only way to usually get to this state is to wear down a monster until the game signals that you can mount the creature. Again, wrong. He's, spot, he's basically talking about like you just beat up the monster and eventually it'll just be able to, uh, you'll be able to hop on it to do a wyvern ride. No, you have to use your silk bind attacks, aerial damage, that builds up, you get past the threshold, then you can do that. Literally, if you watch anybody play the game, they could get a wyvern ride in no time, like within the first couple minutes of the hunt, if that. So when you actually know what you're doing, with the wyvern writing, it's very good. And not only that, but you don't get to wallbang the monster once, you can do it about three times. Four if you have another wire bug. So, you know, there's that. And then the monster falls after you wallbang him that last time. So there's your time to do damage there too, Andrew. While it sounds cool in theory, it's actually quite rough. No, not really. In terms of realism, it makes sense as the creature is trying to throw you off. However, you're basically using special insect silk to make creatures into a virtual puppet. 
It's odd to say the least, and it's part of that new skill ceiling Chris hinted at in our discussion on the game. I don't even know what to say. In terms of realism, it makes sense, but it's odd to say the least. In fact, I'd argue many of the new adjustments come from the wire bug. Well, yeah, that's the point. See, that's the thing, too, is that he wants to talk about these key staples and this and that for Monster Hunter games. He doesn't realize that things like the Clutch Claw that he's about to talk about, they introduce new mechanics that are like the focus or the center of the games. Yes, a lot of the new adjustments are going to come from the wire bug because that's the new staple in this game. Monster Hunter World's Clutch Claw had a bit of adjustment needed as well, but I felt that players received plenty of hints on how to use it, both in terms of UI and intuitiveness. Uh, what do you need with the wire bug? You can literally swing anywhere. That's that's not hard. You don't have to have any kind of like bug or anything to connect to. You just throw it up. It's not it's not hard. Maybe we'll see more of this in full game, but aside from the single pop-up I previously mentioned, I felt like most of what I learned about the wire bug came from the tutorial because that's why the tutorial is there. It it just sounds like entitlement or something. I, I, I can't suss out what it is, but it's just like complaining about not being able to use the wire bug or not it not having intuitiveness when there's an entire tutorial on how to use it but you still want pop-ups in the actual demo itself. It just doesn't make sense. Monster Hunter games are notoriously difficult, but I often overestimate my skills as a veteran. I mean, buddy, don't call yourself a veteran with Monster Hunter, please. While I'm often amazed at how my fingers know when to dodge and barely get me out of harm's way when I've encountered a brand new monster, the wire bug initially made me feel as if I was trying to control a greased brick. Normal running and dodging is what one might expect, but then the wire bug movement suddenly makes me feel as if my character's kick, been kicked forward on ice. The movement is slick, but not in a good way. Okay, so now it's just seeming like more and more that he's pretty salty about this whole wire bug thing and anything that has to do with it because he's not good at using it. And like I said, skill does not equal knowledge, but I mean, it's pretty obvious at this point that he's very unhappy about the whole wire bug thing, and it seems to be because he's not good at it. Chris suggested to me that things like the wire bug will eventually become intuitive to players, and I agree to an extent. All right, so basically, Chris, you should have done this article. I have no idea what made the person, Andrew, get to do this article when he keeps running back to you to explain stuff and get everything fleshed out. While I may overshoot my target still, I'm still zipping in and out of range. It vaguely reminds me of the Attack on Titan's 3D maneuvering gear and the way I use it, which Attack on Titan is awesome, so at least he has that. Especially to recover from knockdown attacks or get out of monsters combos. The thing is, I've seen plenty of people fail to use it, most notably in the demo's intermediate monster battle, Mizutsune. The monster is constantly throwing out bubbles in all directions and heights and will combine that with kind of high blasting water attack. While you may not need to use the wire bug in the battle, it certainly seems to speed things up, which is important because once again, last because hunts once again last 50 minutes max before auto failing you, which even the tone that he says that, it sounds to me like 50 minutes is not enough for uh for Andrew. I often suspect I can tell how new a player is by how she uses the wire bug to battle Mizutsune. Not using is a sign of newness. Over and under launching suggests a learner. And then there are people who are all over the battlefield. Clearly masters. We've had the demo not even a month. And we're already sussing out who the new players are, who the people that are trying to learn it, and who the masters are the masters of rise are with this demo that we have had for two seconds uh to note the creature isn't new to the series so hardcore veterans should have some exposure to it though i admit i skipped the game it appeared in this is the person that is making this article when they completely skipped the game and the last portable game and wants to speak 
on Rise's graphics and how it looks like a 3DS game. Okay, but that being said, I've seen a few discussion about its changes, and one of the things people have noted is that the monster may just not be used to the that players may not be used to the wire bug. With its speed, various height attacks, 360, hose attack, and more, the Mizutsune encounter does seem like a skill check. They didn't make it to where you could just cakewalk Mizu, but, I mean, I don't know about the whole skill check thing at the moment. And sadly, it's one I already see English-speaking fans failing at. Nearly all of my group play has been to hunt the beast. No one seems interested in the beginner hunt. The people mostly seem like veterans too, as I've been with many that took out veteran monster Rathian with few issues, even demonstrating that they could use life powder to heal the group. Oh boy. While I'm no master hunter, clearly, I did solo Mizu, so I couldn't learn the basics, so I could learn the basics and was able to sever its tail and break its head. I also learned about its bubble blight effect, which makes your character movement feel even more slippery than when you're trying to master the wire bug. Yeah, that's the whole point of the status. So the fact that nearly all of my groups failed was disheartening. Admittedly, the demo's a new game and people are still learning. See, that's what I'm talking about. The contradiction over and over and over and over again. He's sitting here already talking about how people are masters of the wire bug. He can tell the ones that are new and tell which ones are trying to learn. Newsflash, literally everybody is still learning because we have had the demo for two seconds. In my frustration, I also wrongly wondered if perhaps the Nintendo Switch audience attracts a more casual player. No, definitely not. The game allows you to choose to group with players from your language group or any language. Communication in the demo is restricted mostly to stamps or phrases, and the default is your language group. The very first time I switched it off, I was grouped with several Japanese players. They were not perfect, but the kill was clean. Okay, now we're getting into weird territory. Obviously, I'm not arguing that Japanese people are innately better at the game. The series is just bigger in Japan, and thus people are more familiar with the series. It also helps that, as I previously noted, Japanese players in Monster Hunter World favored groups. While well, even our own readers, readers admitted that there were times they just solo because of the lack of common Monster Hunter etiquette among Western fans. Randoms have always been a problem. No matter what language they speak, anything like that, randoms, it's always going to be a problem. Especially if you're taking on the harder content because you can't directly communicate in the ways that you can with some other games. You have predetermined messages and this and that and like, well, pre-made. And, you know, you can only communicate so much with that. But that's the thing, too, is that I would say quite the opposite with the, any of the groups that I've played with and even the community hunts that we've had. We can't talk directly to each other, but people in the Monster Hunter community in the West have come up with so many ways to use, like, the stickers and the pre-made messages to get points across. So I don't know who he was playing with, but it sounds like he just had some bad luck finding a good group. And that was why I felt my non-English speaking groups did better. For newcomers, hunter users and other blunt weapons stand at the front because they can dizzy a monster for a bit by whacking their heads. See now, don't, he's talking down to people as if like he has any reason to by using dizzy in quotation. Just say stun. People will understand, I, I promise you. Long, sharp weapons hit the tail most of the time because they can sever it. These two rules aren't interchangeable. Switch axes can't dizzy a monster and hammers can't cut tails. How are we feeling? How are we feeling about that? Can't dizzy a monster. Ooh, this guy. Western players I met didn't follow this rule among others, like using widespreading attacks that can knock over your fellow hunters. Slot and brace, buddy. While it can be fun to experiment with ideas, given that the demo is limited to 30 group quest attempts online, maybe try thinking about working together. <laughs> oh, I was going to say, I mean, like, I've had bad random groups too, but I can't tell you how many times that I've gotten into a random group and we've done absolutely fantastic. I've beaten Fatalis with randoms. I've beaten Latrion with randoms. I don't think that there's been a single monster that I haven't taken out with randoms. 
But to finish up, I do I do want to end on a positive feature though, the Palamute. The Monster Hunter series has long been obsessed with cats. <laughs> Our dog companions, while unable to grant us support such as heels, the Palico cats can, still attack but they also act as mounts. They function so intuitively and so seamlessly that I honestly wish mounts in other games were more like them. They attack with you, emote with you, allow you to mount them while you're running, follow you, and allow you to leap from them to start an airborne attack. And see, that's the thing too. Harking all the way back up at the top where he said that uh, as far as accessibility goes, where is that? Here it is. Rise thus far feels like a step back in terms of accessibility, but a step forward in blah, 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 skill ceiling. Okay, so now another thing that was introduced in Rise is the Palamute which you can ride and run around and sharpen your weapon, eat steak, drink potions, antidotes, anything like that. So going from having to sit in one spot and sharpen your weapon or slowly move around and drink your potion, now you can run on a Palamute and be 99.9% .9 safe while you do those things and moving faster than you could before. So yet again, it's just, you can clearly tell this was not the right person to do the article, but for some reason they let him do it again. In all, the Monster Hunter Rise demo makes the next Monster Hunter series entry feel as if it's aimed more at veteran hunters than trying to welcome new players, but it's not all bad. It's a good reminder that the series does tend to have a bit of a learning curve but already it seems that the game rewards those who invest in it. Crazy that a game would do that. You can't just jump in and be an absolute master in the game. I mean, how crazy is that? But honestly, man, it's... I just don't understand. I don't understand why places do this. Like, it, I know that I made that video before about the person complaining about hunting monsters and how it was cruel when the game is literally called Monster Hunter. And I mean, this one honestly isn't that better, that much better. It, it, it's really not. But that's the thing too, is like how he talks about it, be, it being aimed at veteran hunters rather than new players. I wish he would play the hunting horn. <laughs> like if you want to see some accessibility crank to 11, play the hunting horn in Iceborne and then playing it, play it in Rise and then talk to me about accessibility and appealing to new players. But I mean, regardless, this article was absolute trash. Andrew Ross from Massively OP or whatever, it, this is just a really bad article. If you guys have Chris Neal do an article, please have him do the full release of Rise. Please do not let Andrew make an article about any other Monster Hunter games. It's just, it's not a good look. But that's going to be it for this one, guys. Um, I just kind of wanted to show you this article and just show you just how out of touch some gaming journalists are with the games that they review. And seriously, if you're a gaming media outlet or anything like that, don't let any of your people write reviews or articles about a game unless they're like pretty heavily interested in it and actually have a lot of time playing the game and are actually engaged in the franchise. But outside of that, if you guys like the video, please let me know with that thumbs up. Uh, comment down below what you think of the article and I guess just gaming journalism as a whole and subscribe if you haven't already for more rise monster hunter and other gaming content reviews streams guides and more dudes forever have a good night and happy hunting